Hi, this is Kevin Alves from Netflix Lock and Key, and I'm here sitting with Elias from Man Caves Chronicles. Welcome to another episode of the Man Cave Chronicles. Welcome to the party, pal. You're my boy, bro. Yo, it. It. A podcast with interviews of amazing guests from the world of pop culture. Oh, yeah. TV. Nice. Movies. Oh, I love the movies. Comedy and more from deep inside the Man Cave. Your host, Elias. Kevin, welcome to the cave. Hey, how's it going? How are you, man? What's new with you? Ah, just really excited about Lock and Key coming out. Just kind of seeing fans' reactions. Uh, but it's it's been a lot of fun so far. It's been busy. Right? Yeah. And, and I've been noticing, you know, you've been busy the last few years, man. You started off in professional skating. Then you got into the acting world. But, you know, I want the listeners to get to know a little bit more about you. Where are you originally from? So I was born in Toronto, Canada, and that's where I try and stay based out of. I yeah. spend quite a bit of time in L.A. as well, but um, growing up, I was here in Toronto. And yeah, I was like a crazy seven-year-old who just knew what he wanted to do with the rest of his life. So at seven, I knew that I wanted to skate as a figure skater, and then I wanted to be an actor. But, you know, I also knew growing up that skating was going to have like kind of an expiry date in terms of my professional career. So I put the focus on that when I was younger, and then as my skating career started to uh, started to end, or when I was thinking about retiring, that's when I really started to buckle down and take more acting classes and and figure out where I wanted to be in the industry and what kind of people I wanted to work with. Yeah. So how did you? Uh, <laughs> let's talk a little about the skating first. Like, how did you? Yeah. How did you decide to get into that? <laughs> it was actually really funny. Um, my sister was skating and uh, I was doing actually singing at the time, singing lessons when I was like five. And then when I turned six or I was, yeah, I was just turning six. Um, we went to go watch this show. There's this show that's international called Stars on Ice. And um, there's a really famous Canadian figure skater named Kurt Browning. And um, we watched him do this number and it, it was called Ragatone and he's dressed as a clown. Yeah. And it's it's this music that's chopped up, and it's just guitar strings, but there's no there's no actual pace or timing to it. And he did this incredibly funny, entertaining piece, and you know you have a little six year old Kevin just laughing his head off in the place. And so when I came home, I told my mom that I wanted to skate, and so she went out, got me skates, and she brought me home hockey skates like every mom in Canada would normally do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But um, the minute she brought them home, I saw the box. She opened them up, and I said, no, no, no. I want skates like Kurt Browning. So I started in figure skating right away when I was six. Wow. wow. Tell us a little bit about how like, you, you competed in like, the different uh, world championships. Yeah, so I was really fortunate um, because when I was in my teenage years, I realized that the funding in Canada wasn't amazing for elite athletes uh, as – as Brazil and I grew up uh, a good chunk of my family was born in Brazil and I'd been there a few times. And so I actually started competing for Brazil and the Federation and the country, they were so welcoming and they really pushed me to compete at the junior and senior international level. So when I was 16, I started competing at my first junior world. And by the time I was 18, I was competing at my first senior world. Wow. And I was lucky to compete at two of each. I got to kind of travel the world and compete. I think in my grade 12 year, I was away from school nine or 10 weeks out of the year because I was competing. And uh, it was nice. I, you know, to this day, I think I now have hit like 27, 28 countries that I've been to and majority of them were for skating, which was really great. Wow. Did you ever like think about maybe like Olympics or anything like that while you were doing this? Yeah. So I missed my Olympic birth by three spots in uh, 2010. Oh, wow. And so when I was, when I was reflecting on the year, oh, I was very angry because I was almost qualified after the short program and then I really gave it away in the free program. But at the end of the day, I had to sit back and think about what I wanted. And when we sat there and figured it all out, I competed one more year. And then after that, I realized I wanted to get a head start on my acting career. I didn't yeah. want to wait another three years to go to the Olympics. I have a lot of friends in skating and who have been Olympians. And I thought that the value in me continuing just to go to the Olympics was not as high as the value of me starting my career, my second career. So yeah. I, I just kind of 
chose what I wanted in that moment. And I'm really happy I did because it led to the productions that I had that I've done so far. Plus also I've still kept my foot in the skating door as I help co-run a competitive skating school now. Yeah. So now like while you were growing up, like uh, you said, you know, you knew you wanted to get into the acting world. What pushed you to the acting world? Was it like a specific TV show or movie or even actor or actress that you enjoyed watching? Yeah. Honestly, I think it was just an innate quality in me that yeah. I had no idea. I think I just grew up knowing that that's what I wanted to do. So it wasn't that there was a show that made me want to do it. Just watching every show made me want to do it. Yeah. It was, uh, and I got to do some theater when I was really young. And I think that that, like, that was my fix, right? When I started theater, I, I loved being on stage. But then when I finally started on camera stuff, I realized I loved that even more. So it, I think everything that I tried when I was acting and everything that I saw on screen, like I, I dreamt about it. I think I was in my bedroom most of the time pretending I was on shows and reenacting scenes from Disney shows I was watching at the time. And uh, I think, yeah, yeah I, I think if anyone knew me as an eight year old kid, they'd be like, this kid is nuts. <laughs> um, but it was, it's what I wanted to do right yeah. from then and there. So, there was no stopping little Kevin, man. Yeah. What, <laughs> how, what was your parents' reaction with all this? That you know, you started off with skating and then you got into acting. I was super, super lucky to have the parents that I did because they didn't just support me as an actor and as a skater. They taught me really strong values in terms of like what I wanted to do. So when I I, I grew up singing, skating, acting, doing modeling, and playing rep baseball all at once. Yeah. And so it was really cool, but my mom was also really smart and sat me down when I was like 10 years old and was like, Hey, you know, I want you to do whatever you do really well. And by doing this many things, you're never going to do them as well as you can. So you got to focus on one or two at a time only and make sure that you do them as best as you can. And then if you don't want to do those things, move on to the next thing and that's okay. But always make sure that I was doing what I wanted really, really well and to the best of my ability and being super committed. So that's when I chose skating over baseball and other sports. And that's when I chose acting over modeling and everything else. But I knew that acting had to take a back burner, but my mom, she drove me everywhere. I, I, I spent so much time in the car with my mom and my dad, he worked incredibly hard just to make sure that I was getting every opportunity I had. So it was, it was one of those situations that they were tough on me, but they taught me, just to appreciate and work hard for everything yeah. that I could, yeah, I could get, that. and it was, it was, it was kind of the perfect storm for me with my parents. It was, it was. We worked hard. We were running around everywhere, but I learned so much from it, so yeah. it didn't matter. So when you retired from skating, what was the next step? What did you do to start the acting? So there was actually kind of like an overlap year where I knew that my skating was coming to an end, but that I went out to a really great acting school here in Toronto, and I talked to the director of the school and. He helped me get my first agent and I took classes and I worked really hard during that time, but my, I was still maybe one foot in the door cause I was still skating. But then once I retired, I took auditioning really seriously and I ended up having a friend that moved to LA and I ended up staying with him for a couple of weeks. And that's how I met my managers. Is I literally blasted out the best managers and agents that I wanted to meet with. That's awesome. And and they and I was super lucky. I had a couple in my first trip down to LA that replied to me, and then it was in my second trip down to LA that um, I got to meet this uh, manager that I have now, and she has helped me through all these years now and made sure that I stayed on track. And I don't know what I still to this day I've been thinking. I'm like I need to ask her why she got contacted me over all the people that she gets resumes from because I know that they get a lot of resumes, but she just. She believed in me, and uh, and I've tried really hard not to let her down. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So, I mentioned earlier you've done like numerous TV show appearances, you know, like Shadowhunters, mm. DeGrassi. What's been your favorite? Yeah. And like, and what was your first gig? So, actually, my first principal role gig was on a show with Aaron Ashmore, who's now on Lock and Key, um, called Warehouse Thirteen. I did an episode of that show. It was on Sci-Fi, and. Um, and it was really fun. Uh, it was a cool character. He was like from a private school and um, we had a great time and I met some really cool people on that set. And that was my first principal role with my first agent. And 
Um, I had done commercials when I was younger, but that was my first real acting role. Yeah. And from there, I think uh, I think it was about a month later, I booked that recurring role on Degrassi. And that set, they work so fast and so quick. So you learn on that set because they're pushing out episodes very quickly. And uh, so it was really, it was a good experience to learn from there. But um, honestly, right now, it's a toss-up between both Lock and Key and Shadowhunters because I love both shows for very different reasons. Lock and Key felt like the best family on set. Like I've never been with a cast that truly cares about each other and their and their future in the industry, not just on our show, like Lock and Key. Like and that and that was an incredible feeling to go through while we were shooting the show. And on Shadowhunters, it was this fan feeling where the fans cared so much for the show that you felt like they were just like cradling you through it and they were trying to protect you through the whole thing. And so that was, it was a really cool experience to have fans that cared about your material as much as the Shadowhunters fans did. I, I think I've never met a more dedicated fan base than that fan base for sure. I think they have, may, they may have less in numbers than Game of Thrones, but something was saying that even though their numbers are way lower than Game of Thrones in terms of how many people watch, their social engagement is just as high <laughs> with Shadowhunters, which is, crazy to think that that many people are so invested in the show that they make sure that they their show is seen and lock and key being the most recent show i i, I could not have asked for a better group of people to work with so yeah. i could never pick between the two but they're <laughs> definitely my top two so yeah let's talk about lock and key how exciting has this yeah. been for you uh it you never know what a show is going to be like when you're shooting it that's yeah. the truth so when we're on set you know, we knew how much we loved the show. We knew how much the script meant to us. And, and we know how much these characters mean to us. But you never know what an audience is going to think. And um, it was, it's been a whirlwind. I, I, when the show came out, the amount of people, like we saw billboards in Brazil that we've seen these in Chile. They have this in the mall walkthrough of the show and same thing in Brazil. And, and we're getting messages from people all over the world. And we saw today that we were like the second most watched thing on Netflix today. And it was just seeing stuff like that is, has been super cool. Um, but also sharing it with the cast that we've had, like it's been a really fun experience. Like we all were in the premiere, um, in LA, most of us were there and, um, and getting to see each other again after six months was already kind of like an emotional roller coaster. Mm. So now having the show out, it, we're kind of, I feel more relieved than anything, just knowing that people are enjoying it. Yeah. Now for the listeners that haven't watched this, we know that, it's based off graphic novels, but how would you, yes. when people ask you what the show is about, like, how do you, what do you tell them? Yeah. So uh, the first thing I say is you have Gabriel and Joe who made these comics and they are incredible. So read the comics. That's like my number one thing to anyone. I'm like, if you want to watch the show, also read the comics because even though they're so different, you know, giving the source material that, um, it, it's been an honor to be a part of the source material. So, uh, that, that's my first thing that I always say, but this show is about a family that moves to Matheson and ends up moving into this house that has all these magical keys um, and a villain who is scarier than we ever thought possible. And, um, and, you know, it's about siblings working through their own issues and fighting against evil and teenagers going through their adolescence to me there's a coming of age to our to our story with it being also one of the scariest young shows out there too yeah so tell us about your audition when you first went in there to for the show yeah it was it was cool i had when i first went in for the show i actually didn't have the full script of the episode so i was going based off of just what we knew about really? javi who was a different name at the time which i can say but his original name was different, but then we settled on Javi once the show came to fruition. Um, but yeah, so I just had the script of that character and uh, he was so cool and so funny. And you realize very quickly when the show starts going and when you start dealing, delving into a script that like, he's a day schooler there. He drives into school. He's not one of those, you know, as much as he pretends to be cool, he's not one of the preppy, live in kids at that school he's just trying to act like one so as much as he kind of seems like not a nice person at times hobby 
it's mostly an act. And you learn that really quickly about him when you're going through the script. So the audition process is really cool for me because I got to right away try and show that side of him a little bit where he's kind of, he doesn't want to take things too far. And so that was a lot of fun. Meeting casting director here in Toronto was great. Um, I actually only met the casting directors from LA once I was booked on the show because I only read for the cast directors in Toronto. Mm. So it's a, it's a weird process when you have a show that's shooting in one place and casting in another place. Mm. But um, it was, the audition was a lot of fun right away. And then I, I ended up uh, booking it off of the one audition and that was it. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, because, you know, I don't, I didn't read the comics, but mm -hmm. your character, he was written for the show, correct? Yeah. So my character was written for the show. Um, there's a character that has vague similarities to him much later in the, in the comics, but mainly I feel that, and we haven't had this conversation with Joe, so I'm not a hundred percent sure, but, uh, Brinker kind of feels like he's been split into two on the show and, and we're finding a more caring, um, friend character for, for, um, for Connor's character to have around because in the books, um, you know, Brinker and him get along, but you yeah. know, I think it gives a little bit more dynamic quality to have me and Brinker because then there's kind of like that conscience there when Brinker kind of takes it too far sometimes. So I think, yeah, we were written originally just for the show, my character. And so that, that was kind of different because I didn't have that source material to go off of for my character specifically. Yeah. So like, so when you booked the role, like, so what kind of like research did you do for your character? Did you still go, did you still go back and write the comics? No, even if your character didn't oh, exist? Absolutely, because number one, we want to get a tone for what the story is, yeah. and what are we trying to delve into? Because as much as the show is different from the comics, um, I know Carlton and Meredith, um, the showrunners and creators, they do a really good job at honoring the source material. So I wanted to make sure that Javi also honored the source material, yeah. um, even even if he wasn't in it. I want to make sure that the tone of him was not somewhere far off of what the comics would want and what the show would want as a whole because I want to make sure that um, he's on the same level as the rest of the characters yeah. on the show. Which Is there anything that you would change about Javi? Absolutely nothing because yeah. I think that, you know, if we ever delve further into him, he's a good guy and he does some... I, I think we all do some dumb things and Javi does some dumb things <laughs> and uh, he's trying to fit in. Um, but I truly believe that if push comes to shove, um, there's complexity in Javi that comes from a place that's good. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's there with a lot of our characters. I think, I think this is a show that Joe writ, wrote complex characters in his comic and that led to our writing team and everyone else writing really complex characters into the show as well. Mm -hmm. And now, like, like we mentioned earlier, like you've had great feedback just from people watching this. Like, um, I assume you have fans messaging you on Twitter and Instagram about the show. Yeah, we've definitely gotten more outreach than I even knew was going to happen right away because it's we haven't even hit a week yet. Yeah. So that's the crazy part. Like, we're not even at midnight. At midnight, we'll have hit a week of being out. And um, we've had a lot of people coming to us and, and messaging us. And, uh, you know, I, it's nothing but flattering. Like, I, I love hearing from fans 100%. And, you know, the main thing that I always tell fans when they reach out is I say, I, you know, I want fans to find what that's what our story means to them. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, and that's the main thing that I look for. Like, I love hearing from them as people and I, and I love having those conversations. But I always want to hear about what what kind of they took from the show. Yeah. What's been your favorite scene that you filmed on the show? Hmm. On a show? On, on, the, uh, on Locking Keys, yeah. On Locking Key, I think... Honestly, it was doing the hockey stuff because as a yeah. figure skater, I got to hop on the ice. And I hadn't been in hockey skates since I was a little kid. I had almost never been in hockey skates in my whole life. So when I found out we were playing hockey, me, Connor, and Colton, we all went to with the show. Um, and we got a bunch of new gear. And then we went to go train one day. And uh, it was a lot of fun to train with Connor and Colton because Colton was a hockey player. Connor's never really skated much. And I was a figure skater. So it was kind of this fun um, dynamic for us to play around. And then to shoot that hockey stuff was really entertaining for me because we had a bunch of hockey players on set, right? And um, when they found out I was just a figure skater, 
it was they're like ah that's kind of like you know they're joking around yeah. and then i just started messing with them and doing like really hard stuff in my hockey skates and i was like i've only been playing i've only been in these skates for like two days you guys want to try and some of them actually got up and tried some stuff and they're falling over and so shooting that scene was a lot of fun because i got to kind of combine skating and acting together which um i've never gotten to do before so that was a lot of fun where was the show filmed uh, mainly in Toronto, but also out in Nova Scotia okay. in, in Canada as yeah. well. But, um, our, our stage and the house was here in Toronto. Mm. Now, um, every day, like how long were you on set for filming the, the show? Um, it kind of came down to the day, right? Cause sometimes you'd have multiple scenes in a day and sometimes you had yeah. none. Now someone like Amelia, I really felt bad for her because she was, she lived on that set. Yeah. Um, for me, I just had to come in whenever it was. So some days were really short and some days were really long. Like we had a few days that hit like 12 hour days. And then we had other days that were just, you know, you come in for your one scene, five or six hours. You're out. Of yeah. How was it working with the cast? Like how the, how was the culture in there with you, with everybody? Um, I think I've never been in cast that jokes around as much as our cast. Yeah. We had a lot of pranks. So we had a couple of pranks going on, like, so we had scare pranks going on where we would just get video footage of each other being scared out of the corner. But then we also had uh, taking pictures, like really fast pictures of people when they didn't know. Like it would be like we'd lift the camera, snap pictures. So my phone is filled with just a bunch of pictures of blurry pictures of different actors on our show really close up. Um, and we would just catch each other. And we're, I know, we're saving a few of them for birthdays on Instagram. <laughs> um, then we'll be we'll, we'll put them out there to embarrass each other yeah. um but also just i've never met a cast that spent so much time offset with each other like we went i swear to you we met at the read-through then we had the the netflix um gathering that night and then from that moment on we spent a ton of time together so between me and amelia and griffin we used to stay at amelia's condo with her family until like three o'clock in the morning a bunch of nights and we would just be listening to music or watching. Um, <laughs> we'd be watching stuff on Netflix, and um, we would hang out. We went to karaoke with Jesse, all of us, <laughs> and a bunch of us went to karaoke together. I took a bunch of them skating, actually, downtown. Um, I have amazing video footage of Amelia falling that's going to come out on her birthday. I think her birthday is next week, so that will be very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, yeah, the culture was just spend time together. Yeah, and even awesome. Darby, who's been... Even Darby, who's been in this industry as long as she has, she spent so much time with us. We still have a group chat. We all talk all the time on our group chat. We have a group chat with all of us, and um, we're all sending each other pictures of signs that we see in other places. You know, we're so gushy and telling each other how much we love each other in each scene. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, as be- it's as good of a culture as you can get on a set, mm-hmm. I think. Have you heard anything about season two yet, or is it still too early? We've heard nothing. Um, We've loved the response. Um, We know that they're in the writer's room right now writing season two. That we know. Yeah. So the writers are writing it out. Um, Netflix will make a decision in the time that they decide. Um, I know that they like to leave a show out there for a little bit before they actually make decisions about it. So I think that they're going through their normal process of seeing how the show does within the certain weeks or whatever it is that they do. Um, And then we'll hear about it soon. Um, I'm sure if we hear about it, the world will hear about it very quickly. Oh, yeah. Definitely. So uh, Um, we're really looking forward to it. So what's next for for you? What's next? Um, In reality, um, right now is kind of that busy time of year. It's the first time – it's the first year that I have my work visa for the States. Um, So – I'm auditioning like crazy. I have like uh, a billion self tapes to do on a week to week basis. Um, And then taking meetings and seeing what show comes next and making sure that the show is the right fit. Cause now that I've done a few shows, whatever I do next, I want it to be the right fit. I don't want to just work. I want it to be what feels right. What's next. And my manager is doing a really good job of making sure that we're working on projects that we really, really want to do like lock and key, which I really, really wanted to do when we got the script. So um focused on making sure that the next project's the right one while also when i'm in toronto i'm I'm working with all my competitive skaters while i'm here and helping them achieve their goals and i have a few skaters who want to be at the nationals and world level next year so helping them as best i can while i have some time off of acting that's great so on your downtime what else do you do what do what else do you enjoy doing so this past year i really got into golf 
Really? I know. I'm like an old man. I'm That's like an awesome. old man already. Yeah. So I kind of had this thing where after skating, um, I've always gone into sports and I want to get good at them as quickly as possible. Like I work really, I get really dedicated with whatever sport I'm doing. So when I was growing up in skating, I also did that with tennis. So when I, I was teaching myself tennis and I became obsessive about it and I played so much, but what I realized with tennis, once I stopped skating is you're only as good as the people you're playing. So I always had to go keep playing people and finding new people to play. Whereas when I took up golf at the beginning of last year with a few friends of mine, um, I realized that I can do this all the time by myself. I can grind and grind and grind and get good. So I started off with, I think my first ever round, I shot like a 103 or 104. And now I've took, it's been like, when, when did I start? I started like midsummer last year. And, and when I went to, uh, to LA, I played with a friend of mine and I was already shooting under 90. So I'm like trying to get as good at golf as possible because I really enjoy it. I like being outside too. So that's kind of like been my new thing. But on top of that, I just like spending time with good people, good friends. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, just enjoying their company. Like life is short. Yeah. You sound very positive to stay like that. Yeah. Honestly, I've been really lucky. Like I don't have a yeah. lot to complain about. Yeah. I've been super lucky. I, w- I do work as hard as I can for everything that, that, that comes to me. But, um, but I know that I'm really fortunate to do two things that I absolutely love for the rest of my life. So, you know, when people get to say that, I think, I, I don't think I get to be negative. I don't deserve to be negative because I'm really lucky with the things I get to do and the people that I get to spend my time with. Yeah. Hey, do you have a quote that you live by? Um, yeah, I kind of, ha- I kind of have a few. Now there was one when I was younger that I lived by that ended up when I was on the grassy, people like actually quoted me for it, which was the weirdest thing. But I always find, I always went by when I was younger, I, I decided like, don't go with the flow, make your own. And so I kind of, I kind of always did that. Like I was never the coolest kid. I was never the smartest kid. I was never the, like the it kid, but I always wanted to like what I liked. So I never, I never spend my time worrying about that. I don't like things that other people like, or that, you know, people don't like the same things I like. I, I just, spend my time the way that I want to. Yeah. And I think that that helps me stay focused too, on the things that I'm looking for. Um, and the other kind of quote, it's not even a quote. There's a 10 minute video. If anyone looks at, at it online that w- it's called Will Smith motivation. And, um, and Will Smith talks about um, just a bunch of amazing things um, on that video. And I spent a lot of my young teen life watching that video over and over and over again, just to remind myself when I was kind of going through harder times or when I was feeling a little bit lazy or not motivated, I would spend, I would watch that video and um, it would really kind of get my head in gear. And his, his quote in that was, there's no reason for a plan B because it's just a distraction from plan A. Hmm. And so I always kind of took that to heart because I don't want my plan B to ever feel like a plan B. Yeah. I want whatever I'm doing to be what I want to do. So I work really hard for it and I just go for it. But those are kind of the two things that I live my life by. And, um, and it's working out so far. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep rolling with it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, lastly, Kevin, how can uh, the listeners find you on social media? Yeah. So um, the place that I'm most active is on Instagram. So that's at I T S Kevin Alves. So it's Kevin Alves on Twitter. I'm the Kevin Alves. Um, and on Facebook, you can find me just by searching my name. You can, you can find my page. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I'm, I mean, I engage as much as I can. Uh, there's been a ton of BTS content that's been coming out, um, from lock and key that I've been putting out and the rest of the cats have been putting out and we only have so much more, like our phones are filled with them. So, um, plan on seeing a lot more come out. So that's where to find me. It's Kevin Owls on Instagram. All right, Kevin, this was fun. Thank you for coming on. Thank you so much for having me, man. That's a wrap. That's a wrap, everybody. That's a wrap. Thanks for listening to the Man Cave Chronicles podcast. I finally get my man cave. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at the MCC Podcast. And our website, themccpodcast.com. Until next time.